Greetings, everyone. Koku here. Koku here with his remote setup. But we're here. We are going to discuss this speech um, by Maurice R. Uh, Bishop, as you see him in the thumbnail for tonight's episode. And, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about this. Um, we're going to talk about Maurice Bishop's thoughts uh, on Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and their dreams. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Drop a one if you're here and you can hear me. Drop a one if you're here. Well. All right. Can you guys hear me? All right. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to get into this paper. This was a speech by Maurice Bishop, Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister of the People, former Prime Minister and leader of the People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada. And this is a speech he did in Washington, D.C. back in 1983, not too long before he was assassinated. The learning curve is here. That's the revolutionary matron saying she can hear. Yes, Ketter is here saying he can hear as well. So I appreciate you guys for that feedback. That's always helpful, especially when I'm in this remote setup. Um, it's always helpful to know that folks can hear me. So what we're going to do, we're going to start the show. And on the other side of the intro, we'll get to reading this paper. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAC Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Just want to remind you guys before we get the show rolling that this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. The other shows on the network you are invited to tune into. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Um, let's get right into the paper, shall we? Um, the Learning Curve is here. Keter is here. And anyone else who stops by, drop a one. Let us know that you're here. Make sure I hit the like button as well. And just a real quick reminder that Saturday night shoot the breeze is always a good time. Make sure to pass through, you know, and um, and hang with us, right? Um, we proudly share the noble dreams of Martin and Malcolm. And if you guys have any comments along the way, drop them in the chat. I'll read them live on the air. Right, so uh, we probably share the noble dreams of Martin and Malcolm, a speech by Maurice R. Bishop, Prime Minister, People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada, delivered to the sixth annual dinner of Trans Africa, 
Washington, D.C., June 4th, 1983. I see we got KW Don 7 is here saying Sawabona. Peace to you, KW Don 7. Um, so this is a picture of Bishop here on the right. Um, an unidentified woman and man with Maurice uh, Bishop in Grenada, right? This is Bishop. So um, let's start here. Maurice Rupert Bishop, right? So you see he died on October 19th, 1983, which is just a few months. I mean, less than six months after this speech, he was assassinated, right? He was born May 29th. 1944. Maurice Rupert Bishop was a politician and revolutionary in the island nation of Grenada in the southeastern division of the Caribbean Sea. He became prime minister after a coup by the New Jewel movement in 1979, removed Eric Gary from office, and thereafter Bishop served as prime minister of the People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada until 1983, until he was overthrown in another coup and executed. You know what's crazy is I um I am friends with a a lot of Grenadian folks. You would never guess that they have that kind of um you know that kind of mindset, I guess. You know, to physically remove and stage a coup and execute leaders. If you ever go to Grenada or hang out around Grenada, you'll never tell that, that that they have that spirit in them. You know, that's important to understand. That spirit is in you, man. First, I want to thank Mayor Marion Barry and the people of Washington, D.C. for the presentation of the keys to your historic city. This honor to the government and people of Grenada is something that we will always cherish. I'm greatly honored and greatly moved to find myself here tonight in the presence of a gathering such as this one, a gathering of some of the finest sons and daughters of the heroic Black American people. So right there, you see, you see what he, you know, you see the honor that he gives to what, what people today would call ADOS and FBA, right? To you, I bring greetings from the government and people of our small, brave, and freedom-loving island, nation of Grenada. I also wish to congratulate you on your sixth annual dinner and to express my pleasure for the opportunity to share these precious moments with you. Your history and ours have at times been so closely intertwined as to be near inseparable. We can point to Caribbean American figures such as Marcus Garvey for while he was born in the Caribbean, he has spent many of his more productive years living and working in the USA. By the same token, our, 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 our Harry Belafonte is also your Harry Belafonte. Many eminent and distinguished Black Americans are Caribbean born or of Caribbean heritage. We point to a few examples such as Malcolm X and Sidney Poitier. Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, and Cicely Tyson. In fact, in the case of Malcolm, his mother came from a small village in Grenada called Ladige. It is certain that some of you here tonight also share this distinction of Caribbean heritage, Caribbean American heritage. So you see what Keto says in the chat. He says he connects immediately with the African American family. You understand? And I like what he says here. Our Harry Belafonte is your Harry Belafonte. You understand? In fact, in the case of Malcolm, his mother came from a village in Grenada called Ladige. It is certain that some of you here tonight also share this distinction of Caribbean American heritage. The history, the problems, and the aspirations of the masses of people in Africa of Africa, the Caribbean, and Black America are, ex are extraordinarily similar. And that is why Trans Africa is an organization which, with so much meaning and relevance to us all. Tonight, I salute the policies and recommendations that Trans Africa has initiated and the work accomplished on behalf of the people of Africa and the Caribbean. Right? 
of Africa and the Caribbean. Let me just check up something here real quick. Okay. So Trans-Africa, formerly Trans-Africa Forum, is an advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. that seeks to influence the foreign policy of the United States concerning African and Caribbean countries and all African diaspora groups. They are a research, education, and advocacy center for activism, uh, focusing, I just had a blink out here, uh, focusing on social, economic, and political conditions in Africa, the Caribbean and Latin America, and other parts of the African diaspora. They are the largest and oldest social justice organization in the United States that focuses on the African world. They have served as a major research, educational, and, and organizing institution for the African and African descendant communities and the U.S. public in general. So that's just to give a background on what that group is, right? Uh, so, so just to repeat, and that is why Trans Africa is an organization with so much meaning and relevance to us all. Tonight, I salute the policies and recommendations that Trans Africa has initiated and the work accomplished on behalf of the people of Africa and the Caribbean. Indeed, tonight's event is a timely testimony of your tenacity, your fierce independence and judgment of will, and your dedication to justice, equality, and freedom for us in the developing world. Consistent with the above, we are certainly happy to endorse Trans-Africa's recommendations of June 1982 that the United States, given its immense leverage with South Africa, should adopt a policy of escalating economic and political sanctions against that country with the aim of bringing about an end to apartheid and the independence of Namibia. So this is you're right. So this is in Reagan's time. Apartheid is still still crazy in, in South Africa. The links between our people and the 30 million black people of America go far back into the chronicles of the European assault on our ancestral land and our common struggle against racist oppression and the enforced transportation of our ancestors to the Americas. The struggle of the black American people has been a constant source of inspiration to the liberation struggles of the peoples of the world. In every corner of the earth where people are struggling or have struggled to win their freedom, the names of your great leaders are honored and people draw strength from your struggles and your victories. We know the role that the example of your fighters and the ideas of your thinkers have played in the liberation of their ancestral country, Africa. No one can deny the influence of people like W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, Langston Hughes, and Martin Luther King on the awakening of the political consciousness of Africa. The independence movements in Africa sprang directly out of the Pan-African movement, which in turn owed a great deal to the spread of liberation ideology from Black America and the Caribbean. See, that, that, that this is why when folks talk about Pan-Africanism is one-sided and Pan-Africanism is dead and all this whole uh, nonsense, th that's when I know you haven't studied anything. And you're willfully ignorant at this point, right? As regard Black America and the Caribbean, your fighting history has had a most significant hearing upon the course of Caribbean history, bringing with it an interesting interaction, a cross-fertilization of our two destinies. I must also say that our country, Grenada, with the same fierce determination as that of African states and Black America, has embraced Africa's number one priority, full, unconditional liberation and self-determination for Southern Africa. In the exercise of this embrace and endearment of Africa, thousands of our people have warmly received in Grenada, President Kenneth uh, Kaunda, President Samora Machel, and Sister Sally Mugabe, the courageous and inspirational wife of President Mugabe and a leader in her own right. Let me also at this time reiterate our firmest support for the African National Congress, the ANC, the representative political organization of the Black people of South Africa, and SWAPO, the authentic 
uh, representative of the of the Namibian people. Let me also restate our conviction that the government and people of Mozambique will defeat the aggressions against them, and that the government and people of Angola will continue to consolidate their revolutionary process. For sisters and brothers, to be very open and frank, what worries us about the Southern African struggle is not just the brutal, aggressive, and expansionist policies of South Africa, but also the attitude of the powerful USA administration to the conditions of misery and suffering in that part of the world. The warm and friendly relations between the United States and South African governments in defiance of the UN is really an affront to humanity. The open hostility of the United States administration to Grenada, while at the same time embracing South Africa, underlines the serious hypocrisy of the present administration and has painted an image that does not that does no justice to the greatness of the American people. These uh, to me sound like famous last words, right? In Central America. What we are experiencing is the extension of the same attitude that again negates the interests and aspirations of the people of this region and the course of history. After all, the entire region, including the USA, has had a history of struggle for independence and freedom from domination. How can the American Revolution and War of Independence be ever forgotten? Revolutionary upheavals in Central America and the Caribbean today are only the continuation of these struggles with different forms in some respects, but fundamentally the same in essence, the struggle for national liberation, peace, and justice. Because this is so, the question arises, what is the way forward in these troubled parts? We in all honesty think that only the people of Central America can solve their problems. Contadora, the much debated initiative advanced by Mexico, Panama, Venezuela, and Colombia must be seen as a step in the right direction and therefore given the fullest support. Recognition of the right of the people of Central America to themselves solve their problems through dialogue and negotiations, replacing violence and outside interference must be given a chance to prevail. This is a fundamental demand because the people of Central America have bled for too long. Consider the case of Nicaragua, whose people have suffered so much during this century from military invasion of their country through the many years of the brutal and corrupt Somoza dynasty to this day of CIA-backed and trained counter-revolutionaries and mercenaries. What crime have they, the Nicaraguans, committed? The only crime that they are guilty of is the same committed by the American colonies in their war of independence the struggle for justice and self-determination. We join with most of humanity in demanding that the people of Nicaragua be given a chance to build their country and their future in peace along the path that they choose. As regards El Salvador, let me once again say boldly our support for the French-Mexican Declaration of 1981, which is aimed at bringing together the different representative forces of El Salvador for dialogue. The failure of the United States administration to support these initiatives, which are the only realistic options for peace and social security in Central America, is really unfortunate and regrettable. And it brings to the surface once again the image of this administration as being insensitive to the just aspirations of the peoples of the third world. Let me pause here for a second. Let me pause here for a second. As I have some of you here with me tonight, let me ask you guys this. Why do Black equals African folks spend so much time trying to shame America? Like, I, 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 you know, I, I'd love to hear from you guys. Why does... Black equals African folks spend so much time telling America, trying to shame America by telling America what it does, you know, to people, against folks. Like, why do we spend so much time telling them what they already know? 
that's something for some time now. I, I can't figure out. Like you think, you know, all respect to Bishop, but you think you're going to come in the belly of the beast and tell, and, and, and tell America some emotional shit? How hurt you feel and how hurt these people must feel that America should so, like why do why bother? I see we got Kevin Carre here in the chat saying greetings family. Y'all say what's up to Kevin Carre. He says to me, emotional response to America. A lot of these folks don't want to do the legwork. Hmm. He says America doesn't care. So if, I, if I'm understanding Kevin Curry well, who's a regular panelist on Shoot the Breeze on Saturdays, he's saying that these emotional responses are in hopes of America does the work. That's an interesting take. How many of you in the chat, or those of you listening, how many of you agree with that? You know, how many of you agree with that? To continue, at home in Grenada, our people have a similar perception of the United States administration. This has come about as a result of the strained relations that have existed between our two governments since our March 13th revolution. Our people have never failed to contrast the poor state of relations between the United States and Grenada today with the embrace that the brutal and corrupt dictator Eric Gary received from successive U.S. governments before the revolution. Up till very recently, our requests for dialogue have been met consistently with economic, political, diplomatic, and military pressures on our young revolution. From the first days of coming to power, the United States pursued a policy which showed no respect for our national pride and aspiration and sought constantly to bring the revolution to its knees. Many of our efforts to build a new economy have been undermined by the United States and multilateral institutions such as the IMF and World Bank. And as you know, bilateral assistance has not been forthcoming. In 1981, our regional institution, the Caribbean Development Bank, was offered four million for basic human needs projects on condition that Grenada be entirely excluded. Let me read that again. In 1981, our regional institution, the Caribbean Development Bank, was offered four million for basic human needs projects on condition, on condition that Grenada be entirely excluded. Another example of this policy is to be found in the U.S.-sponsored CBI, which excludes Grenada from being a participant for purely political reasons. We have faced tremendous adverse propaganda, especially against our new international airport project. We faced military pressure in August 1981 from a naval exercise called Operation Amber and the Amberines, designed to intimidate Grenada. They have not agreed to our request for an exchange of ambassadors and even letters which I wrote to President Reagan in 1981, proposing normalization of relations and early high-level talks have not been responded to. These actions by the United States administration over the last four years constitute definite unfriendliness towards our young revolution and young nation. On reflection and analysis, we conclude that such an attitude exists principally because Grenada has taken a very decisive and firm step on the road to genuine national independence, non-alignment, and self-determination. This is certain. It is also certain that nations and peoples everywhere with internal, legal, and public opinion on their side are more and more taking their own destinies in their hands and fashioning their own reality. The 1776 Revol uh, American Revolution was history-making testimony to this fact. The sovereignty of a people is non-negotiable. And for us in Grenada, inheritors of a deep sense of pride and independence, not an iota of our rights, is negotiable. 
not an iota of our rights is negotiable. Mm. I see we got Bobby E. Wright in the chat. I see we have some comments. Let me read those comments real quick before I continue. Um, Keta says, because we believe that the U.S. has a conscience. Mm. Mm. He says, due to its continuous proclamation of freedom, democracy, and human rights, they confuse us. I like that. I like that. Keta is basically saying, even the enlightened are confused. You see our problem here? Even our enlightened are confused. Even our enlightened have been propagandized. And thus, as Keta says, they're confused. Thanks for that comment, Ken. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Carre, sorry about that. Kevin Carre says America is about their money. If they can and will sacrifice you for money and power, they will. America only respects power. Like I said, Bobby E. Wright is here saying greetings. Uh, he says, great reading. I appreciate that as well. He also says, uh, sorry, Kevin Carre uh, says, welcome family. All right? Keta says, very true to Kevin Carre. And, and Bobby Wright says, I remember watching Maurice Bishop's speech at Medgar Evers College live on C-SPAN in 1983. Bobby Wright, is that right? Interesting. Okay, so Bobby, you were in New York at the time. I didn't. I, I didn't know that. Okay, you were you went to Medgavers. Okay, nice. I I'm also a CUNY grad, like Kevin Carey as well. I didn't know that. Okay, kudos to know that. That's cool. So, you remember watching this speech? That's that's interesting. That's very interesting. I'm I'm glad that you shared that with us. Um. To continue, and you guys post your comments. I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll read them on air. You guys post your comments. If there's something in here, in this reading that you hear that's of interest, you know, point it out. Oh, Bobby Wright says he was just visiting. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Um, to continue, it's also apparent that Grenada is perceived as part of Washington's geopolitical designs. The numerous private and public assurances given by my government that we constitute no threat to the national security interests of the United States of America, or for that matter, of anyone else, should have been adequate long ago. However, once again, in your presence here tonight, we repeat these assurances and reemphasize our efforts towards secure, friendly, and mutually respectful relations with our neighbors, including the United States of America. A third issue has been national elections. The new Grenada, like your country, was born in a great revolutionary act of liberation. The American Revolution gave itself a period of 13 years to consolidate before holding the first election. In South Africa, there is no electoral process for blacks who are the majority of the population. Why isn't the United States administration withholding its massive support for South Africa until democracy is instituted for the millions of disenfranchised blacks there. And let us recall that despite the fact that the government of President Salvador Allende of Chile was duly elected and instituted by the approved parliamentary processes, yet none of this deterred a previous US administration from violently overthrowing this regime and liquidating its leadership and thousands of its people. Mm. And that's the thing, like, this confusion is, is puzzling because you know what they did in, 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 in Chile. So, I don't, so what is it that you don't get? What is it that you don't get? Kevin Carre is giving us an update here. He says, Frank R. James ID'd as person of interest in Brooklyn subway shooting. So you guys could click the link and check it out. Yeah, there was a shooting in the train uh, train station today in Brooklyn. 
in an area that's notably um, Asian, to be honest. And they said that it's a black guy um, who's a suspect. He popped off a, a smoke grenade and then started shooting and wounded about 16 people. But I don't think anyone is seriously injured. Um, so I guess now he, I, I guess they have a name for this person suspected of doing the shooting. So, uh, and I was talking to Kevin Cowery earlier and he, he gave me a thought, you know, something to think about that they're trying to bring back, uh, stop and frisk in New York. And this looks like a psyop because why would I do, you know, why? Right. I'll just leave it at that. Why? Right. Um, so the idea is that um, perhaps this is a psyop and it's a way to push this agenda of bringing back stop and frisk. So keep your eyes on that, folks. Keep your eyes on that. Kenner says, you, the U.S. acting just like Russia. Considering Grenada, it's fear of influence. Russia claims the same with Ukraine. Yes, yes. Yes, that's true. Um, sister, uh, to continue, sisters and brothers, friends, despite all of these clear inconsistencies, these painful and damaging actions against Grenada, this clear pattern of unfriendliness, we remain fervently committed to the normalization and improvement of relations with your government, for this is in the best interests of our two peoples. I wonder, do, do you think, do you think Bishop saw the writing on the wall and was like, let me try to make good with these people? Because again, this is less than, than half a year away from his, you know, ultimate assassination, right? In these very days, we are engaged in an earnest search for meaningful dialogue at appropriate levels. And as far as Grenada is concerned, we are willing to go into talks with an open mind and without preconditions. For us, the true bottom line is, let us talk now. Domestic developments in Grenada are satisfying. Many achievements are being recorded and temporary dislocations are being resolved. The most significant achievement in four years of revolutionary transformation is the development of institutions of popular participatory democracy through which the legacy of backwardness and underdevelopment is being wiped out in Grenada and real material benefits are coming to our people. Well, I, 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 I'll tell you right now, America ain't trying to hear that right there. America's whole aim, especially in this hemisphere, is to keep everyone backwards and underdeveloped. That's America's whole get down, especially in this hemisphere. Keep everyone backwards and develop. We talked about the Monroe Doctrine in the past. We talked about all these shipping routes that that are, are, are through, like right through the Caribbean and Central America and South, and South America too, right? And we talked about how if you keep those countries backwards and underdeveloped, America gets to 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 bring its goods in and feed its people without any resistance and without having to to strike deals with these Caribbean countries that are also beneficial or have some benefit to those Caribbean countries. One of those major waterways is right around Haiti. Right? Panama Right between the Bahamas, uh, Cuba, uh, Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, there's these waterways. And America gets most of its imports to be able to feed its people through the Caribbean Sea. Right there in New Orleans and stuff like that. Right? And so, and so America's whole game is keeping the Caribbean backwards and underdeveloped, to be frank. Over the past four years, unemployment has been dramatically reduced. In fact, unemployment has been reduced from 49% to 
to 12%. And we have introduced free health care and free education for all our people. You know, when you reduce unemployment from 49 to 12%, you know, you like, you have less of your people leaving the country to go to America, less brain drain. You, I mean, 12 is still relatively high, but 49%? One out of every two people was, was, was unemployed? America ain't trying to hear that. This is why we got to get to work. We have to get to work. Make sure you guys hit, hit the like button for me, if you don't mind. Hit the like button, if you don't mind. And I thank you all for being here. All right? A fifth and final component of our new democracy, electability, is already being experienced by our people through their mass organizations, where fair and open elections are held on a regular basis. And in due course, this process will also be extended to the national level. Our sisters and brothers, among our proudest achievements is the development of institutions of popular democracy. Participation in trade unions and other mass organizations has grown by leaps and bounds. New organizations of women, farmers, youth, and workers have been formed, and existing ones have been grown stronger. A system of monthly parish and zonal councils open to all citizens ensures free, regular discussions of issues, permanent contact between government and people, and strictly and strict accountability and responsibility of the leadership of the government and party. So let me just add this too. I was alive in this time, right? Uh, and I'll tell you something I realized, man. Right? And I think Ketter is from the Caribbean as well, Kevin Carre, a few of you in there from the Caribbean. There's nothing nicer, and you guys can agree or disagree, but there's nothing nicer, right? There's nothing nicer than witnessing, when I was growing up, witnessing those older folks who had been British subjects and all that old shit, got their independence, and you see them. Like, well, what does, like what uh, Bishop is talking about right here? You see them in their little groups, their little organizations, and they're talking about the country. They're talking about the wishes for the future. They're talking about what's wrong. And like, not all those people were quote unquote educated. Not all those people were quote unquote educated, but they understood, right? And they came together. They knew something was, they, they knew it was something new, something exciting. And, and that's something like at this point when Bishop is talking, uh, the Bahamas was was about to celebrate 10 years of independence. You understand? Was about to celebrate 10. And I could remember as a kid, folks used to sit around and have those discussions, those little kind of community council. Like they talked about zonal meetings and all that, so zonal councils and all that kind of stuff. Like I could remember that. And I don't see that as much today. We got Athrazer here. Peace to that brother, Athrazer. He says, thanks for this reading. I have the book of his speeches on my shelf. Been through some or most of it. That's nice. Drop the name of that book for us so we could uh, check it out, please. Right? And you guys check out Athrazer's channel. He's many things, among which he's a uh, mechanical engineer, mathematician, math teacher, and a street musician. If you check out his channel, you see a lot of his his work. You you get to hear a lot of his music and stuff like that. He's currently seeking out help to get his music a little further. So if you guys uh, can help in any way, even if it's just to subscribe to his channel, I'm sure he'll appreciate it. Keta says Grenada was a model. Absolutely. All right. Um, of course, the revolution, like all previous revolutions, has brought disrupting and temporary dislocations in Grenada. A small number of persons 
have had to be detained. Some press freedoms have been limited and elections have not yet been held. Our government understands the difficulties these situations pose. However, it is important to repeat that all revolutions involve temporary dislocation. And for a period, it is always necessary to restrain the abuses and excesses of a violent or disruptive minority in the interest of consolidating the revolution and bringing concrete benefits to the long-suffering and formerly oppressed majority. The People's Revolutionary Government and the people of Grenada have regarded development of the economy, improvement of the standard of living, expansion of education and employment, development of the popular organizations, and the improvement of the country's defenses as matters having priority over constitutional reform. The time has come, however, to take the process of the formal institutionalization of the revolution. Sorry, the time has come, however, to take the process of the formal institutionalization of the revolution a stage further and commence work on the preparation of a new constitution. We take this opportunity to announce tonight that a commission was today appointed in Grenada and charged with the task of formulating a meaningful, democratic, and workable constitution for our country. The commission comprises Alan Alexander, state council and former high court judge, a distinguished Trinidadian lawyer of great experience and prestige, Richard Hart, outstanding historian and lawyer, and the present attorney general of Grenada, Ashley Taylor, an outstanding Grenadian lawyer. In addition to these three eminent jurists, one representative to be selected by the Grenada Trades Union Council, the umbrella organization for all our labor unions in our country, and one other representative of the other mass organizations of farmers, women and youth in our country. In this way, the views of all classes, strata and sections in our country will be represented on the, con on the Constitution Commission, taking into account the views of our people, including all minority views. The Commission has been mandated to formulate within a period of 24 months, a Constitution relevant to the needs of our vibrantly developing society. After the findings of the Constitutional Commission have been submitted to our government. The draft constitution will then be discussed in detail by the people of our country. These discussions will result in a second draft, which will include the ideas of the people. And when a, and when a referendum is held and all due process completed, a new people's constitution, the first in our history, would have come into existence. This new constitution will define all dimensions of our electoral process, and in particular, Will, in, will institutionalize the systems of popular democracy which have been introduced by our government and which have given such depth and meaning to the term participatory democracy. Because of the momentous nature of tonight's announcement, I want to crave your indulgence to read the terms of reference of the commission. He says, to obtain information on alternative forms of political constitutions and the ways in which political constitutions work in practice in other countries, to receive and consider written and all representations as to matters which should be provided for and the form and structure of a constitution for Grenada. Next, to receive and consider the views and proposals of all classes, strata, and interests of the Grenadian people. Let me pause here for a second and ask a question. How many of you study or have studied constitutions? And besides, I, I, I think most people here have read the Haitian constitution, if I had to guess. What other country constitutions you think are solid and, are, and it's something that more of us should study, right? Like, I'm pretty familiar with, of course, my own constitution. Mr. Untouchable used to, who, who's a regular on Shoot the Breeze as well. He's, a, he's on the panel and, and produces many of the prompts. Uh, he revealed to us that he used to have a program teaching Bahamians um, how to understand the constitution. Uh, what other countries have a solid constitution that we should probably study 
a little bit more. Because again, we we are builders, right? We are we are trying to make ourselves nation builders and help lay foundations for a nation. Um, we need to study these things too. We need to see who's successful at at you know who has been successful, who's who's damn close, right? So I'm just curious if you guys have, if any of you have studied the constitution of any other, say, African country or, or what have you, and that you think is worthy of our study. Um, let me finish this off, and then I'll, I'll read the um, comments in a section. In a second. To receive and consider the views and proposals of all classes, strata, and interests of the Greenian people, to prepare for public consideration and discussion of draft constitution and participate in public and other discussions thereon, to consider and assess written and oral proposals for improvement or alteration of the draft constitution received from organization groups or individuals. And lastly, to uh, yeah, lastly, to prepare the government with such notes and other supplementary materials as may be appropriate a final draft constitution for approval by the people of Grenada in a referendum. Mm. So that, that gives you a little idea that when you talk about nation building, there's work to do. Even when you so-called acquired the nation, right? There's work to do. Uh, in the chat, Keto says Grenada, is a, Grenada was a model he says Grenada was becoming a true participatory democracy. The U.S. definitely hated that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Ketter. Bobby Rice says, I have the book. It's called Maurice Bishop Speaks. Oh, right. Maurice Bishop Speaks. That's right. That's right. That's right. I think I have that book in a PDF. I might even have it up on the Discord under the BM library. So if you guys want to, if you haven't already, uh, join the Discord, go to the BM library. And uh, I'm pretty sure, I think I have it there because I'm pretty sure I have it as a PDF. Kevin Carrey 42 said to Athrazer that he just subscribed to his channel. So Athrazer, you just gained a new sub, you know. Bobby Wright says the Tanzanian Arusha plan from the 1960s by Julius Nayere was progressive. He says Maurice Bishop was, a, was, a, was an admirer of Niere, Arusha plan. Yeah, I, I read that plan in an episode too, so you guys can go back and look that up. I love the plan as well. Um, and that's what I'm saying. Like, we got to, you know, we were talking on Shoot the Breeze the other night that perhaps shoot like a, a program like Shoot the Breeze is, is maybe better suited not for trying to convert people to what we're on, but more so to get the people who are like us. I'm talking about me and all of you in the chat right now and anyone who's listening to this program in the future. Um, maybe the, the idea is to get us together and talk about what are we going to do next? What's next? And so this is a part of it, right? A part of this whole thing. Like when you talk about when you talk about African-centered education and whatnot, you know, uh, things like this, like what did black nations do to become that nation? What was their form of government? What was their constitution? Like all of that stuff needs to be in a curriculum as well, right? And if you guys are interested, let me know. Maybe that's something I can do in the future. Give me some suggestions if you if you want. Maybe I'll I'll go through and break down the constitutions of several other um, several other uh, black nations, if you would, right? And I'm always uh, interested in you guys' help too, man. If you want, just um, hit me up and say, yeah, I'll be down for that. You know, shoot me a DM. Um, on the Discord, you know what I mean. Shoot me a DM on the Discord, and we could talk about this stuff. 
To continue, as we strive to bring social and economic benefits to the people of our country, we look forward now to an event of tremendous significance to our economy, to our people, to our future development, the opening of the new international airport. So if you didn't know, maybe some of y'all weren't around at the time, maybe you weren't paying attention to the Caribbean at the time, but this airport that Bishop was talking about here, this airport is what Reagan and them justified the U.S. invasion of Grenada for. You understand? Because their thinking was that it was an international airport. It could land big um, big planes out of Russia, you know, the then Soviet Union and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the, I could remember it so clearly when the U.S. invaded. I could remember watching Reagan on TV talking about this invasion and the airport and showing these aerial views of it. I, I remember, I was young, but I remember looking at this shit and was like, y'all invaded Little Grenada? Like, I was old enough to figure out, like, wait a minute, Little Grenada, y'all? Really? So, yeah, so this international airport is was probably the death knell for this brother here. To continue, those of you who have visited our country know just how important this project is to both our peoples. And those of you who have not done so will soon have the chance, as I now invite you to join with hundreds of others who will be on the inaugural flight from Washington to Grenada on the day the airport, the airport opens, March 13th, right, 1984. Certainly, if you can make it, this will give you an opportunity to travel to the most widely publicized international airport the world has ever known. That's a wink wink right there. Let us thank those responsible for all the free publicity. We certainly look forward to welcoming on that inaugural flight as many of you as possible. We will welcome you with the greatest pleasure and look forward to your sharing with us the tremendous joy of that important event. Sisters and brothers, the unity and solidarity of our people is of great importance. We see it as our duty to support every initiative for the unification of the peoples of the Caribbean, who are not only part of the same geographical formation, but who share basically common history and culture, the history of slavery and colonialism, the culture which we have forged from the legacy of Africa. So you see, Bishop, Bishop ain't shying away from being African, right? Just take a note um, to continue. As we take initiatives aimed at finding solutions to the problems of small island states, as we focus upon the need to find more efficient and less costly transportation services between the islands of the Caribbean region, as we repeatedly issue the call for the Caribbean region to be declared and recognized and practiced as a zone of peace, independence, and development, as we host conferences of labor leaders, journalists, and intellectuals who discuss the problems of the region, we are guided always by the vision of the Caribbean as one people aiming together a genuine peace, independence, and development. Brothers and sisters, the economic achievement of the poor and the dispossessed peoples of the world is a matter of great concern to us. We cannot support a system in which transnational corporations interested only in profit bolster racist regimes like that of South Africa and contribute to the suffering and hardship of millions of our brothers and sisters. The existing international economic order makes a mockery of dreams of development for our struggling people. We must support the establishment of a new international economic order aimed at the ownership and control by developing countries of their, of their economic resources and at a system of international trade based on just prices by exports. Mm. Mm. We got Jay here. Jay says, what's up, fam? What's up, chat? Y'all say what's up to Jay, man. Jay is also one of the panelists. Recent additions to the Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze. Great addition as well as Kevin Carray and the others who join us regularly on that platform, right? You all say what's up to Jay. 
1982 Agreement on the Law of the Sea is an important achievement and should be recognized as such by all countries sensitive to the problems of underdevelopment since it seeks to ensure for developing countries a just share of the resources of the sea. If you just came in like Jay just came in, it seems, we're reading this speech by um, Maurice Bishop, former prime minister of Grenada, assassinated in 1983, just a few months after this speech. And this speech is called, We Proudly Share the Noble Dreams of Martin and Malcolm. I, I think um, others in the chat have said, you can find this work in Maurice Bishop Speaks. Uh, you should be able to find that there. And, uh, you know, Bobby Wright actually remembers seeing uh, Bishop give this speech on C-SPAN back in the day. You know? There you go, Bobby Wright. Appreciate that. So to continue, um, we're actually also at the end of this, too, by the way. Um, to continue, Grenada continues to give support to the North-South Dialogue and the need for the resumption of the global negotiations, convinced that the world's industrialized countries have a responsibility to assist with the establishment of a just and equitable international economic order, which is objectively in their interest as well as in the interest of the developing world. But no new international economic order is possible. No development can take place in any area of the world without the necessary social infrastructure of world peace. Let me ask you guys something. This idea of world peace, you know, I've been hearing this stuff <laughs> since I'm a since I'm a small child. Since about the time that Maurice Bishop gave this speech, I could remember hearing this talk about world peace. My question is is that a pipe dream? World peace? Is that a pipe dream? You guys let me know in the chat. I'll read your comments in a moment. By far, the most important struggle in the world today is the struggle for peace. The very existence of humanity is threatened by the insane drive to stockpile weapons of mass destruction. Think of the tremendous waste of one country's spending, of one country spending U.S. $83 trillion on arms over the next five years. And this, when there are so many people jobless, when there are so many starving, illiterate, unemployed people all over the world. I have another question for you guys. Was Bishop serious here? Or, or, or was Bishop just naive here? Atherzer answers the first question in the chat. He says world peace is not a pipe dream. Sorry, he says world peace is not a pipe dream. No more so than African unity. He says it is a direction that we have to relentlessly build towards. It is what we truly desire, to live in peace and harmony. After so I, I respect that response. I do. But that's you as, a, as an African, right? Maybe Africans believe that there could be world peace. You know, Black people, African people believe that. But does this Eurasian believe in world peace? Interesting, right? Kevin Carre says world peace equals European domination of black people. World peace is like multiculturalism, a melting pot that boils over. World peace is a European wet dream. Yeah, so you see how I, I, I again, I respect Arthur's take. You know, and I hear Kevin Carre. We got Marcus McGee here in the chat. You all say what's up to Marcus McGee. Again, thanks all to all of you for coming through and checking out the, the show on a Tuesday night. I appreciate that. You know, make sure you hit the like button. Marcus McGee says African unity could usher in more peaceful times to the world. You know, I, I actually agree with that too. 
I actually agree with that too. Um, I'm loving these responses. Bobby Rice says in 1981, Bishop met Thomas Sankara at the Non-Aligned Summit in India. They became friends and shared many ideas. Man, that's dope too. Athelstan says perhaps that peace will come when we when we exterminate those who can't live peacefully. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, what do they call what do they call that again? Uh, plot twist. Plot twist. Perhaps that peace will come when we exterminate those who can't live peacefully. I could see that. Some people think that's uh, that do that doesn't make sense. You, you're fighting for peace, but actually fighting for peace makes all the sense in the world. Bobby Wright says, no world peace. No, he says, no, world peace is not possible while Europeans dominate the global economy. If you put all of your responses to that question together, you know, it makes sense. If you put all of your responses together, the one, two, three, four, five of you that responded there, it makes sense. I'll be curious to hear what Jay has to say. Jay says, off topic maybe, wasn't Grenada the first country bombed by America's F-117? Was it? Let me see. Let me look that up real quick. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't remember that. I wouldn't remember that that detail, uh, but it's possible. It's possible. Um, yeah, it seems like it was used in I, I I don't know if it was the first. I'll have to take time and look it up when I'm not live. But I think it. I think it's possible. Right. Um. Where was I now? By far the most important struggle in the world today is the struggle for peace. The very existence of humanity is threatened by the insane drive to stockpile weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, I read this before. Think of the tremendous waste of one country spending US 83 trillion on arms over the next five years. And this, when there are so many people jobless, when there are so many starving, illiterate, unemployed people all over the world. Statistics show that the cost of one modern tank could pay for the construction of a thousand classrooms for 30,000 children in developing countries. That the price of a Trident nuclear submarine equals the cost of keeping 16 million children from underdeveloped countries in school for a year, plus the cost of constructing 400 large living complexes to house 2 million persons. So, again, you know, uh, Bishop was was a crafty dude too. So he's not a dummy. This education thing has long been understood by none. Who doesn't understand that it is just because you ain't trying to understand it? The wealthy have always wanted to keep everyone else dumb. And to protect themselves and their wealth, not only do they have to keep people dumb, but they also have to keep putting money into weapons of mass destruction. Be it cannons, be it F-117s, whatever it is, they've had to do it. Right? So, th so this is why it should be understood by Black Eagles African people, wherever we are, we got to change the education, right? These styling figures certainly give added impetus to the ever-strengthening call of the world's peoples for peace in this hemisphere and make even more sadly ironic the hunger and deprivation of so many millions of people the world over. Grenada calls for an end to the arms race with serious negotiations aimed at strategic arms limitation for a move towards genuine disarmament. Increasingly, the people of the world are realizing the need to speak out against warlike and confrontationist policies 
to insist that there be dialogue aimed at establishing a lasting peace. Do you guys agree with that? Do you think that there needs to be strategic arms limitation? There needs to be a move towards disarmament? Or do you think that other peoples outside of uh, the U.S., other countries, other nations need to need to pick up steam in that department and get themselves more arms and try to balance it out? You know, YouTube does this thing where it's showing me I have zero listeners, zero viewers right now. And I know that's not the case, you know. But I guess I'm talking some real stuff here. You guys, hit one if you still hear my voice so that I know that YouTube didn't just um, shut down the stream or some nonsense like that. If you could do me that favor, type one if you hear my voice. So I know it's not the case that YouTube shut me down for what it is we're talking about. To continue, together we must insist that the policies on Southern Africa, on Central America, on the Middle East, and on the Caribbean be aimed at ensuring peace, justice, and progress for the peoples of these regions. Sisters and brothers, we call upon you as an important foreign affairs lobby of the United States to continue to analyze the actions of your country in the world today. If the world is to be at peace, if the suffering and deprived peoples of the world are to attain some program of progress and justice, the United States must, as a world power, pursue policies which show a clear understanding and appreciation of the problems of developing countries. Sisters and brothers, friends, your country must approach these problems not with arrogance and condensation, but with sensitivity and empathy. I, 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 well, I personally feel that the U.S. has none of those things mentioned. Okay, so you guys, you guys are here, and quite a few of you are here, and like Arthur says right here, YouTube is a lying sack of shit. I appreciate that honesty, right? A few of you are here. Well, Keta says, I believe mutual fear is good for the world. If we all armed ourselves, then, then we'll talk. I, I, I agree with that, especially on like a on an individual level. Like I, I live in New York, right? And the gun laws in New York are prohibitive, right? Restrictive as hell. But that don't stop the dusty dudes from drawing weapons on you. That don't stop dudes from running up in your house. Right? The bad dudes are gonna be bad dudes anyway. They're gonna have guns. But if those bad dudes had the idea, right, because the gun laws were were seriously relaxed and everyone had the ability, especially in their homes, to have some hardware, those dudes would think twice about running up in your house. The guy who who ran up on the train today, if he if we were if he was in one of these states um, where there's open carry and, and concealed carry and all that kind of stuff going on. He would think twice about running up in that train uh, station, and so I, I, so I, I, I scale that up to what Kenner is saying. Like, yeah, like if we all have weapons, folks will, folks will, will, will carry themselves appropriately. You know. Thanks for that comment. Arthur says, I think we have to be duplicitous. We have to ask the, these aggressors to limit their arms. Mm. Okay. He says we have to, at the same time, arm ourselves, but accept the reality that we don't have the budgets to match their capabilities. And that I agree with. <coughs> Pardon me. We won't have the budgets, but we'll have something. Right now, we largely have nothing going on. Right? Um, Keto says then we need a black hegemon to protect us. Yes, sir. Uh, Athera says, Bishop appealing to the morals, the quote-unquote morals of America is partially theater. This appeal exposes them. It's not that he expects them to care, but he's calling them out by the standards they pretend uh, to. You know? Yeah, I, I, I agree. That's why I said he's he's a bit crafty. He's not as naive or whatever. Uh, and in fact, I, I think he might be actually, because he's using this platform, he might be just really trying to inform 
the people here, the black Americans, because he starts this off hailing up black Americans first. And he might be just trying to give a, a wink and a nod. You know what I mean? Uh, Arthur says, if he was in Texas, he would have got God. Yeah, he, he's talking about the uh, the guy who who shot some folks up in a in a train station today in Brooklyn, right? You know, Keto says definitely in Texas. Yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. Like, you have to think twice in a in a place where you know that everyone has an opportunity to have a gun. You have to think twice about running up in in their spot. You know what I mean? And, and that's how I think we should think about it in terms of, of nationhood and black nations. You might not have the budget that these guys have, but you got something. And something is better than nothing. It's better than cowering in a corner somewhere. You know what I mean? Uh, Bobby Rice says, Bishop knew that the anti-socialist or communist agenda was strong in the United States. So he being diplomatic by appealing to our people in America. Yeah, yeah, you know, a wink and a nod. You know? All right, let me continue. This would augur well for world peace and would lead to better relations among all the nations of the world. <clears throat> the April 1983 report of the Linowitz Commission on the Inter American Dialogue shows a great deal of recognition of this need for understanding, cooperation, and dialogue. The peoples of our region and the peoples of the United States cry out with one voice for peace for sanity, for justice, for dignity. Now, the problem with this approach is, the problem for this approach is that sometimes when you play this game, you actually got black folks, African folks who, who, who don't understand the game. And they, they really start sitting up here thinking about world peace and you know, start championing that cause, right? That's the that's the one problem with it, right? Um, the peoples of our region and the peoples of the United States cry out with one voice for peace, for sanity, for justice, for dignity, bearing in mind the importance of dialogue and understanding to the proper conduct of international relations and the tremendous importance of peace to our dreams of development and progress. We once again reiterate our genuine interest in establishing normal bilateral relations with the United States administration. We remain open to honest and genuine proposals for dialogue at appropriate levels. We must show in our mutual approach to the resolution of our difficulties a spirit of inter-American equality and respect. That's a, that's a politician talking right there. He says Grenada cherishes the vision of a new Caribbean civilization free from oppression and exploitation where the conditions will exist for every man, woman, and child to exercise to the fullest their human potential. Finally, sisters and brothers, finally, and by the way, you know what? Before I hit that finally, this, this is the last part of the paper. This is where he really addresses the Martin and Malcolm, uh, you know, the noble dreams of them. Um, but real quick, I just want to remind you guys that I am a part of a podcast network. A lot of you guys are familiar with the pro-black perspective, the learning curve with the revolutionary matron, the Hash Ali podcast. But of course, I do want to remind you to make sure to tune in to those other shows as well. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, sir. I had to take that quick station idea break just to remind folks to tune into the other shows. Great show on Sunday from Onita Say discussing the enemies within. And also getting into that Afrocentricity split with uh, Dr. Malefe Asante. Make sure you check that out as well. 
Um, yeah. In the chat, um, Kevin Carey 42 says, one step at a time. Keto says, America fears any nation which could bomb it back. They pick fights with weak nations who can't take out those big cities in the U.S. And that's absolutely true. Thanks for that. Thanks for those comments. So let's just finish it up here now. Finally, sisters and brothers, friends, we proudly share with you the noble dreams of Martin and Malcolm for an America free of racism and discrimination, for a world free of hunger, poverty, and strife, for a future free of want and despair. Right? This is how you know all of this was a wink and a nod to black folks here. With sincerity and humility, we thank you for your kind invitation to be here at this time, for your past, present, and future support, and for the warmth and hospitality you have unhesit unhesitatingly sh uh, showered on me and my delegation. We invite you to soon visit our friendly country so that we may, re we may reciprocate your gracious cordiality and show you the revolutionary achievements of our people. Long live friendship between the peoples of the United States and Grenada. Long live peace in our Americas and in the world. Together we shall overcome for whatever, backwards, never. Right? <clears throat> and I think, um, I think Keta just um, kind of summed up that whole speech pretty well right here. He says, Bishop was being very diplomatic and pragmatic. So there's a picture here at the end. Um, people gathered at the New Jewel Movement National Secretariat in Grenada. All right. So you see folks here. I, I, I thought that was a, a good speech, a good thought-provoking speech. It kind of shows you a little bit of what it takes or what it requires to be the head of a nation. Uh, I think that we had a good conversation from the chat on this as well. So I appreciate all you guys who came in today. Bobby Wright says, the pro-black perspective is a great platform. I checked it out on Sunday. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I'm usually, I try to be there each um, Sunday. I know Keta is usually there as well. I want to thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Let me try to hit everyone up. Keta was here. Bobby Wright. Kevin Carey, 42. Ath Reserve was here. Good insights. Jay was here. Make sure to check us out on the Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze. KW Don 7 was here. Marcus McGee was here as well. Uh, did I miss anyone? Earlier, we had the learning curve. That's the revolutionary matron was here. All right? So I want to thank all of you for coming through tonight. Tuesday night, you guys were great in the chat. I'll see you guys. I'm hoping for Thursday. I know I've missed a few Thursdays in a row now. It's just been a real busy time. Hoping for Thursday. If not, you'll definitely see me again, and I, I'm sure I'll see many of you the Saturday night shoot the breeze. You guys be good. Take care. And uh, I'll see you soon. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, bittermedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Bitter Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Bitter Medicine Show, Twitter, Bitter Meds, Tumblr, Bitter Meds, Instagram, Bitter Medicine.